Hello, and welcome to our first virtual theatrical show. I'm Deb Jackson, Executive Director of Old Town Playhouse. We know you miss experiencing live theater, and we certainly miss performing it. A closed theater impacts thousands of patrons like yourself and hundreds of volunteers that normally work on shows. Actors, directors, designers, set builders, costumers, stage managers, musicians, and technical crews all call Old Town Playhouse home and thrive on the friendships and creativity found here. Someday the stage lights will come back on and once again the Playhouse will be buzzing with activity. We are really looking forward to that day. But in the meantime, we are working on other performances that we can bring to you virtually. We are so grateful to our patrons who support us financially and make engaging community theater a reality here in Traverse City. We need your help now to bridge the shutdown gap, work on the building, put together content to stream for you, and be ready when the pandemic is behind us and we can reopen. <clears throat> Many of you have asked how you can help sustain us until we reopen. Donations of cash or stock are fantastic. But you can also help Old Town Playhouse by sharing our content on social media so that we can expand our reach, like with the unique performance you're about to see. Please share it with your friends. Phantasms of a Fevered Imagination features Reader's Theater combined with original music and artificial harmonics that are performed within a prepared piano. It is so intriguing. We ask that you consider a minimum donation of $20 for this performance. Consider it your ticket price. Thank you for your support, stay well, and know that we miss performing for you. Now sit back and enjoy Phantasms of a Fevered Imagination. I Felt a Funeral in My Brain by Emily Dickinson. I felt a funeral in my brain with mourners to and fro kept treading, treading till it seemed that sense was breaking through. And when they all were seated, a service like a drum kept beating, beating till I thought my mind was going numb. And then I heard them lift a box and creak across my soul with those same boots of lead again and space began to toll as all the heavens were a bell and being but an ear and I and silence some strange race wrecked solitary here And then a plank in reason broke, and I dropped down and down, and hit a world at every plunge, and finished knowing then. Restless, shifting, fugacious as time itself is a certain vast bulk of the population of the red brick district of the Lower West Side. Homeless? They have a hundred homes. They flit from furnished room to furnished room, transients forever, transients in abode, transients in heart and mind. They sing home sweet home in ragtime they carry their cherished possessions in a bandbox. Their vine is entwined upon a picture hat. A rubber plant is their fig tree. Hence the houses of this district, having had a thousand dwellers, should have a thousand tales to tell, mostly dull ones, no doubt. But it would be strange if there could not be found a ghost or two in the wake of all these vagrant guests.
One evening, after dark, a young man prowled among these crumbling red mansions, ringing their bells. At the twelfth, he rested his lean hand baggage upon the step and wiped the dust from his hat band and forehead. The bell sounded faint and far away in some remote hollow depths. To the door of this, the twelfth house whose bell he had rung, came a housekeeper who made him think of an unwholesome surfeited worm that had eaten its nut to a hollow shell and now sought to fill vacancy with edible lodgers. Do you have a room to let? Come in. I have a third floor back, vacant since a week back. Should you wish to look at it? The young man followed her up the stairs. A faint light from no particular source mitigated the shadows of the halls. They trod noiselessly upon a stair carpet that its own loom would have forsworn. It seemed to have become vegetable, to have degenerated in that rank, sunless air, to lush lichen or spreading moss that grew in patches to the staircase and was viscid under the foot like organic matter. At each turn of the stairs were vacant niches in the wall. Perhaps plants had once been set within them. If so, they had died in that foul and tainted air. It may be that statues of saints had stood there, but it was not difficult to conceive that imps and devils had dragged them forth in the darkness and down to the unholy depths of some furnished pit below. This is the room. It's a nice room. It ain't often vacant. I had some most elegant people in last summer. No trouble at all. And paid an advance to the minute. The water's at the end of the hall. Sprouls and Mooney kept it three months. They done a vaudeville sketch. Miss Bretta Sprouls, you may have heard of her. Oh, that was just the stage names. Right over there on the dresser is where the marriage certificate hung, framed. The gas is here. And you see there is plenty of closet room. It's a room everybody likes. It never stays idle long. Do you have many theatrical people rooming here? They comes and they goes. A good proportion of my lodgers is connected with the theaters. Yes, sir, this is a theatrical district. Actor people never stays anywhere long. I get my share. Yes, they comes and they goes. He engaged the room, paying for a week in advance. He was tired, he said, and would take possession at once. He counted out the money. The room had been made ready, she said, even to towels and water. As the housekeeper moved away, he put for the thousandth time the question that he carried at the end of his tongue. A young girl, Miss Vashner, Miss Eloise Vashner. Do you remember such a one among your lodgers? She would be singing on the stage, most likely. A fair girl of medium height and slender with reddish-gold hair and a dark mole near her left eyebrow. No, I don't remember the name. Dead stage people have changed their names as often as their rooms. No, I, I don't call that one to mind. No. Always no. Five months of ceaseless interrogation and the inevitable negative. So much time spent by day questioning managers, agents, schools, and choruses. By night, among the audiences of theaters from all star casts, down to music halls so low that he dreaded to find what he most hoped for. He, who had loved her best, had tried to find her. He was sure that since her disappearance from home, this great, water-girt city held her somewhere, 
but it was like a monstrous quicksand shifting its particles constantly with no foundation. The upper granules of today buried tomorrow in ooze and slime. The furnished room received its latest guest with a first glow of pseudo-hospitality, a hectic, haggard, perfunctory welcome, like the specious smile of a demirep. The, the, the sophistical comfort came in reflected gleams from the decayed furniture, the, the ragged brocade upholstery of a couch and two chairs, a foot-wide cheap pier glass between the two windows, from one or two gilt picture frames, and a brass bedstead in the corner. The guest reclined, inert upon a chair, while the room, confused in speech as though it were an apartment in Babel, tried to discourse to him of its diver's tenantry. A polychromatic rug, like some brilliant flowered rectangular tropical islet, lay surrounded by a billowy sea of soiled matting. Upon the gay papered walls were those pictures that pursue the homeless one from house to house. The Huguenot lovers, the first quarrel, the wedding breakfast, Psyche at the fountain. The mantle's chastely severe outline was ingloriously draped behind some pert drapery that drawn rakishly askew like the sashes of the Amazonian ballet. Upon it was some desolate flotsam, cast aside by the rooms marooned when a fresh sail had borne them to a new port. A trifling vase or two, pictures of actresses, a medicine bottle, some stray cards out of a deck. One by one, as the characters of a cryptograph became explicit, the little signs left by the furnished room's procession of guests developed a significance. The threadbare space in the rug in front of the dresser told that lovely women had marched in the throng. The tiny fingerprints on the wall spoke of little prisoners trying to feel their way to sun and air. A splattered stain, raying like the shadow of a bursting bomb, witnessed where a glass or bottle had splintered with its contents against the wall. Across the pier glass had been scrawled, with a diamond in staggering letters, the name Marie. It seemed that the succession of dwellers in the furnished room had turned in fury, perhaps tempted beyond forbearance by its garish coldness and wreaked upon it their passions. The furniture was chipped and bruised. The couch, distorted by bursting springs, seemed a horrible monster that had been slain during the stress of some grotesque convulsion. Some more potent upheaval had cloven a great slice from the marble mantel. Each plank in the floor owned its particular cant and shriek as from a separate and individual agony. It seemed incredible that all this malice and injury had been wrought upon the room by those who had called it for a time their home. And yet it may have been the cheated home instinct surviving blindly, the resentful rage at false household gods that had kindled their wrath. The young tenant in the chair allowed these thoughts to file soft-shod through his mind while there drifted into the room furnished sounds and furnished scents. He heard in one room a tittering and incontinent slack laughter. In others, the monologue of a scold, the rattling of dice, a lullaby, and one crying dully. Above him, a banjo tinkled in spirit. Doors banged somewhere. The elevated trains roared intermittently. A cat yowled miserably upon a back fence. And he breathed the breath of the house. A dank savor rather than a smell, a cold, musty effluvium as from underground vaults mingled with the reeking exhalations of linoleum and mildewed and rotten woodwork. 
Then suddenly, as he rested there, the room was filled with the strong, sweet odor of mignonette. It came as upon a single buffet of wind with such sureness and fragrance and emphasis that it almost seemed a living visitant, and the man cried aloud. What? Dear? As if he had been called and sprang up and faced about, the rich odor clung to him and wrapped him around. He reached out his arms for it, all his senses for the time, confused and commingled. How could one be peremptorily called by an odor? Surely it must have been a sound, but was it not the sound that had touched, that had caressed him? She has been in this room. He sprang to rest from it a token, for he knew he would recognize the smallest thing that had belonged to her that she had touched. This enveloping scent of mignonette, the odor that she had loved and made her own, whence came it? The room had been but carelessly set to order. Scattered upon the flimsy dresser scarf were half a dozen hairpins. Those discreet, indistinguishable friends of womankind, feminine of gender, infinite of mood, and uncommunicative of tense. These he ignored, conscious of their triumphant lack of identity. Ransacking the drawers of the dresser, he came upon a discarded, tiny, ragged handkerchief. He pressed it to his face. It was racy and insolent with heliotrope. He hurled it to the floor. In another drawer, he found odd buttons, a theater program, a pawnbroker's card, one or two lost marshmallows, a book on the divination of dreams. In the last was a woman's black satin hair bow, which halted him, poised between ice and fire. But the black satin hair bow also is femininity's demure, impersonal, common ornament and tells no tale. And then he traversed the room like a hound on the scent, considering the corners of the bulging matting on his hands and knees, rummaging mantle and tables, the curtains and hangings, the drunken cabinet in the corner, for a visible sign, unable to perceive that she was there, beside, around, against, within, above him, wooing him, clinging to him, calling him so poignantly through the finer senses that even the grosser ones became cognizant of the call. Once again he answered loudly, Yes, dear! And turned wild-eyed to gaze on vacancy, for he could not yet discern form and color and love and outstretched arms in the odor of mignonette. Oh, God! Whence that odor? And since when have odors had a voice to call? He burrowed in crevices and corners and found corks and cigarettes. These he passed in passive contempt, but once he found in a fold of the matting a half-smoked cigar, and this he ground beneath his heel and cursed with a green and trenchant oath. He sipped dreary and ignoble small records of many a peripatetic tenant, but of her whom he sought, and who may have lodged there, and whose spirit seemed to hover there, he found no trace. And then he thought of the housekeeper. He ran from the haunted room and downstairs into a door that showed a crack of light. She came out to his call. Will you tell me, madam, who occupied the room I have before I came? Yes, sir, I can tell you again. Twas Sprouls and Mooney, as I said. Miss Bretta Sprouls, it was in the theaters, but Mrs. Mooney, she was. My house is well known for respectability. The marriage certificate hung, framed on a nail over the dresser. What kind of lady was Miss Sprowls? In looks, I mean. 
Why, black-haired, sir, short and stout with a comical face. They left a week ago Tuesday. And before they occupied it? Why, there was a single gentleman connected with the drain business. He left owing me a week. Before him was Mrs. Crowder and her two children. They stayed for months. And back of them was old Mr. Doyle, whose sons paid for him. He kept the room six months. That goes back a year, sir, and further I do not remember. Thank you. He crept back to his room. The room was dead. The essence that had vivified it was gone. The odor of mignonette had departed. In its place was the old, stale odor of moldy house furniture, of atmosphere and storage. The ebbing of his hope drained his faith. He sat staring at the yellow, singing gaslight. Soon he walked to the bed and began to tear the sheets into strips. With the blade of his knife, he drove them tightly into every crevice between windows and door. When all was snug and taut, he turned out the light, turned the gas full on again, and laid himself gratefully upon the bed. It was Mrs. McCool's night to go with the can for beer, so she fetched it and sat with Mrs. Purdy in one of those subterranean retreats where housekeepers foregather and the worm dieth seldom. I rented out my third floor back this evening. A young man took it. He went up to bed two hours ago. Now did you, Mrs. Purdy, ma'am? It do be a wonder for renting rooms of that kind. And did you tell him then? Rooms are furnished to be used by those who need them. I did not tell him, Mrs. McCool. Oh, tis right you are, ma'am. Tis by renting the rooms that we keep alive. You have a real sense of business, ma'am. There be many people reject the renting of a room if they be told a suicide had been after dying in the bed of it. As you say, we has our living to be making. Tis, yes, tis true, ma'am. Tis just one week ago this day. I helped you lay out the third floor back. A pretty slip of a colleen she was to be dying with the gas. A sweet little face she had, Mrs. Purdy, ma'am. She'd have been called handsome, as you say. But for that mole, she had it growing by her left eyebrow. Oh, do fill your glass again, Mrs. McCool. The Shadow on the Stone by Thomas Hardy. I went by the druid stone that broods in the garden, white and lone. And I stopped and looked at the shifting shadows that at some moments fall thereon from the tree hard by with a rhythmic swing. And they shaped in my imagining the shade that a well-known head and shoulders through there when she was gardening. I thought her behind my back, yea, her I had longed to lack. And I said, I am sure you are standing behind me, but how do you get into that old track? And there was no sound but the fall of a leaf as a sad response. And to keep down grief, I would not turn my head to discover that there was nothing in my belief.
that I wanted to look and see that nobody stood at the back of me. But I thought once more, nay, I'll not unvision a shape which somehow there may be. So I went on softly from the glade and left her behind me, throwing her shade as she were indeed an apparition, my head unturned, lest my dream should fade. Wraith by Edna St. Vincent Millay Thin rain, whom are you haunting that you con at my door? Surely it is not I she's wanting, someone living here before. Nobody's in the house but me. You may come in if you like and see. Thin as thread, exquisite fingers. Ever see her, any of you? Gray shawl, leaning on the wind with a garden showing through. Glimmering eyes, silent mostly. Sort of a whisper, sort of a purr. Asking something, asking it over, if you get a sound from her. Ever see her, any of you? Strangest thing I've ever known. Every night since I moved in and I came to be alone. Then rain. Hush your knocking, you may not come in. This is I that you hear rocking. Nobody's with me, nor has been. Curious how she tried the windows. Odd the way she tries the door. Wonder just what sort of people could have had this house before. The Terrible Old Man by H. P. Lovecraft. It was the design of Angelo Ricci and Joe Zanuck and Manuel Silva to call on the Terrible Old Man. This old man dwells all alone in a very ancient house on Water Street near the sea, and is reputed to be both exceedingly rich and exceedingly feeble, which forms a situation very attractive to men of the profession of Messrs. Ricci, Zanek, and Silva, for that profession was nothing less dignified than robbery. The inhabitants of Kingsport say and think many things about the terrible old man, which generally keep him safe from the attention of gentlemen like Mr. Ricci and his colleagues. Despite the almost certain fact that he hides a fortune of indefinite magnitude somewhere about his musty and venerable abode, he is, in truth, a very strange person, believed to have been a captain of East India clipper ships in his day, so old that no one can remember when he was young, and so taciturn that few know his real name. Among the gnarled trees in the front yard of his aged and neglected place, he maintains a strange collection of large stones, oddly grouped and painted so that they resemble the idols in some obscure eastern temple. This collection frightens away most of the small boys who love to taunt the terrible old man about his long white hair and beard, or to break the small paned windows of his dwelling with wicked missiles. But there are other things which frighten the older and more curious folk who sometimes steal up to the house to peer in through the dusty panes. These folk say that on a table 
in a bare room on the ground floor are many peculiar bottles. In each, a small piece of lead suspended pendulum-wise from a string. And they say that the terrible old man talks to these bottles, addressing them by such names as Jack, Scarface, Long Tom, Spanish Joe, Peters, and Mate Ellis. And that whenever he speaks to a bottle, the little lead pendulum within makes certain definite vibrations as if in answer. Those who have watched the tall, lean, terrible old man in these peculiar conversations do not watch him again. But Angelo Ricci and Joe Zanuck and Manuel Silva were not of Kingsport blood. They were of that new and heterogeneous alien stock which lies outside the charmed circle of New England life and traditions. And they saw in the terrible old man merely a tottering, almost helpless graybeard who could not walk without the aid of his knotted cane and whose thin, weak hands shook pitifully. They were really quite sorry in their way for the lonely, unpopular old fellow whom everybody shunned and at whom all the dogs barked singularly. But business is business. And to a robber whose soul is in his profession, there is a lure and a challenge about a very old and very feeble man who has no account at the bank and who pays for his few necessities at the village store with Spanish gold and silver minted two centuries ago. Messrs. Ricci, Zanek, and Silva selected the night of April 11th for their call. Mr. Ricci and Mr. Silva were to interview the poor old gentleman, whilst Mr. Zanek waited for them and their presumable metallic burden with a covered motor car in Ship Street, by the gate in the tall rear wall of their host's grounds. Desire to avoid needless explanations in case of unexpected police intrusions prompted these plans for a quiet and unostentatious departure. As prearranged, the three adventurers started out separately in order to prevent any evil-minded suspicions afterwards. Messrs. Ricci and Silva met in Water Street by the old man's front gate, and although they did not like the way the moon shone down upon the painted stones through the budding branches of the gnarled trees, they had more important things to think about than mere idle superstition. They feared it might be unpleasant work making the terrible old man loquacious concerning his hoarded gold and silver, for aged sea captains are notably stubborn and perverse. Still, he was very old and very feeble, <laughs> and there were two visitors. Messrs. Ricci and Silva were experienced in the art of making unwilling persons voluble, and the screams of a weak an exceptionally venerable man can be easily muffled. So, they moved up to the one lighted window and heard the terrible old man talking childishly to his bottles with pendulums. Then, they donned masks and knocked politely at the weather-stained oaken door. Waiting seemed very long to Mr. Zanuck as he fidgeted restlessly in the covered motor car by the terrible old man's back gate in Ship Street. He was more than ordinarily tender-hearted, and he did not like 
the hideous screams he had heard in the ancient house just after the hour appointed for the deed. Had he not told his colleagues to be as gentle as possible with the pathetic old sea captain? Very nervously, he watched that narrow oaken gate in the high and ivy-clad stone wall. Frequently, he consulted his watch and wondered at the delay. Had the old man died before revealing where his treasure was hidden, and had a thorough search become necessary? Mr. Zanuck did not like to wait so long in the dark in such a place. Then he sensed a soft tread or tapping on the walk inside the gate heard a gentle fumbling at the rusty latch, and saw the narrow, heavy door swing inward. And in the pallid glow of that single, dim street lamp, he strained his eyes to see what his colleagues had brought out of that sinister house, which loomed so close behind. But when he looked, he did not see what he had expected, for his colleagues were not there at all. Terrible old man, leaning quietly on his knotted cane and smiling hideously. Mr. Zanuck had never before noticed the color of that man's eyes. Now he saw that they were yellow. Little things make considerable excitement in little towns, which is the reason that Kingsport people talked all that spring and summer about the three unidentifiable bodies, horribly slashed as with many cutlasses, and horribly mangled as by the tread of many cruel boot heels which the tide washed in. And some people, even spoke of things as trivial as the deserted motor car found in Ship Street, or certain, especially inhuman cries, probably of a stray animal or migratory bird, heard in the night by wakeful citizens. But in this idle village gossip, the terrible old man took no interest at all. He was, by nature, reserved, and when one is aged and feeble, one's reserve is doubly strong. Besides, so ancient a sea captain must have witnessed scores of things much more stirring in the far-off days of his unremembered youth. A Chilly Night by Christina Rossetti I rose in the dead of night and went to the lattice alone to search for my mother's ghost where the ghostly moonlight shone. My friends had failed one by one, middle-aged, young, and old, till ghosts were warmer to me than my friends that had grown cold. I looked and I saw the ghosts dotting plain and mound. They stood in the blank moonlight, but no shadow lay on the ground. They spoke without a voice and they leaped without a sound. I called Oh, my mother dear, I sobbed, oh, my mother kind, make a lonely bed for me and shelter it from the wind. Tell the others not to come to see me night or day. 
but I don't have to tell my friends to be sure to keep away. My mother raised her eyes. They were blank and could not see, yet they held me in their stare while she seemed to look at me. She opened her mouth and spoke. I could not hear a word. How the flesh crept on my bones and every hair was stirred. She knew I could not hear the message that she told, whether I had long to wait or soon would sleep in the mold. I saw her toss her shadowless hair and wring her hands in the cold. I strained to catch her words and she strained to make me hear but never the sound of words fell on my straining ear. From midnight to cockcrow, I kept my watch in pain, while the subtle ghosts grew subtler in the sad night on the wane. From midnight to cockcrow, I watched till all were gone, some to sleep in the shifting sea, some under turf and stone. Living had failed, and dead had failed, and I was indeed alone. The Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe The Red Death had long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal, and madness and the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness, then profuse bleeding at the pores with dissolution. The scarlet stains upon the body, and especially upon the face of the victim, were the pest ban which shut him out from the aid and from the sympathy of his fellow men. And the whole seizure, progress, and termination of the disease were incidents of half an hour. But Prince Prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious. When his dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court, and with these retired to the deep seclusion of one of his crenellated abbeys. This was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the prince's own eccentric yet august taste. A strong and lofty wall girdled it in, This wall had gates of iron. The courtiers, having entered, brought furnaces and massy hammers and welded the bolts. They resolved to leave means neither of ingress nor egress to the sudden impulses of despair or of frenzy from within. The abbey was amply provisioned. With such precautions, the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion. The external world could take care of itself In the meantime, it was folly to grieve or to think. The prince had provided all the appliances of pleasure. There were buffoons, 
There were improvisatori, there were ballet dancers, there were musicians, there was beauty, there was wine. All these and security were within. Without was the Red Death. It was toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion that the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. It was a voluptuous scene, that masquerade. But first, let me tell you of the rooms in which it was held. There were seven, an imperial suite. In many palaces, however, such suites form a long and straight vista while the folding doors slide back nearly to the walls on either hand so that the view of the whole extent is scarcely impeded. Here the case was very different, as might be expected from the Duke's love of the bazaar. The apartments were so irregularly disposed that the vision embraced but little more than one at a time. There was a sharp turn at the right and left. In the middle of each wall, a tall and narrow Gothic window looked out upon a closed corridor of which pursued the windings of the suite. These windows were of stained glass, whose colour varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations of the chamber into which it opened. At the eastern extremity was hung, for example, in blue, and vividly blue were its windows. The second chamber was purple in its ornaments and tapestries, and here the panes were purple. The third was green throughout, and so were its casements. The fourth was furnished and lighted with orange. The fifth with white. The sixth with violet. The seventh apartment was closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries that hung all over the ceiling and down the walls, falling in heavy folds upon a carpet of the same material and hue. But in this chamber only, the colour of the windows failed to correspond with the decorations. The panes were scarlet, a deep blood colour. Now in no one of, the, of any of the seven apartments was there any lamp or candelabrum amid the profusion of golden ornaments that lay scattered to and fro and depended from the roof. There was no light of any kind emanating from lamp or candle within the suite of chambers, but in the corridors that followed the suite, there stood opposite each window a heavy tripod bearing a brazier of fire that projected its rays through the tinted glass and so glaringly lit the room and thus were produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances. But in the western or back chamber, the effect of the firelight that streamed upon the dark henny hangings through the blood-tinted panes was ghastly in the extreme, and produced so wild a look upon the countenances of those who entered that there were few of the company bold enough to set foot within its precincts at all. It was within this apartment, also, that there stood against the western wall a gigantic clock of ebony. Its pendulum swung to and fro with a dull, heavy, monotonous clang. And when the minute hand made the circuit of the face and the hour was to be stricken, there came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound which was clear and loud and deep exceedingly musical, but of so peculiar a note and emphasis that at each lapse of an hour, the musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause momentarily in their performance to hearken to the sound, and thus the waltzers perforce ceased their evolutions, and there was a brief disconcert of the whole gay company, and while the chimes of the clock yet rang, it was observed that the giddiest grew pale and the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their brows as if in confused reverie or meditation. But when the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter had once pervaded the assembly. The musicians looked at each other and smiled as if at their own nervousness and folly, and made whispering vows, each to the other, 
that the next chiming of the clock should produce in them no similar emotion. And then, after the lapse of 60 minutes, which embraced 3,600 seconds of time that flies, there came yet another chiming of the clock, and then were the same disconcert and tremulousness and meditation as before. But in spite of these things, it was a gay and magnificent revel. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar. He had a fine eye for color and effects. He disregarded the decorum of mere fashion. His plans were bold and fiery, and his conceptions glowed with barbaric luster. There were some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt he was not. It was necessary to hear and see and touch him to be sure he was not. He had directed in great part the movable embellishments of the seven chambers upon occasion of the great fete. And it was his own guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. Be sure they were grotesque. They were much, there were much glare and glitter and piquancy and phantasm. Much of what has been seen in Hernani there were arabesque figures with unsuited limbs and appointments. There were delirious fancies such as the madman fashions. There were much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, something of the terrible, and not a little of that which might have excited disgust. To and fro in the seven chambers stalked, in fact, a multitude of dreams. And these the dreams writhed in and about, taking hue from the rooms and casting the wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their steps. And anon, there strikes the ebony clock which stands in the hall of the velvet. And then, for a moment, all is still and all is silent, save the voice of the clock. The dreams are stiff frozen as they stand. But the echoes of the chime die away. They have endured but an instant, and a light, half-subdued laughter floats after them as they depart. And now the music swells, and the dreams live, and writhe to and fro more merrily than ever, taking hue from the many-tinted windows through which stream the rays of the tripods. But to the chamber which lies most westerly of the seven, there are now none of the maskers who venture, for the night is waning away. And there flows a ruddier light through the blood-colored panes, and the blackness of the sable drapery appalls. And to him whose foot falls on the sable carpet, there comes from the near clock of ebony a muffled peal more solemnly emphatic than any which reaches, reaches their ears who indulge in the more remote gaieties of the other apartments. But these other apartments were densely crowded, and in them beat feverishly the heart of life. And the revel went whirlingly on, until at length there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock. And then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolutions of the waltzers were quieted, and there was an uneasy cessation of all things as before. But now there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock. And thus it happened that perhaps more of thought crept with more of time into the meditations of the thoughtful among those who reveled. And thus too it happened that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure which had arrested the attention of no single individual before. And the rumor of this new presence, having spread itself whisperingly around, there arose at length from the whole company a buzz or murmur of horror and of disgust. In an assembly of phantasms such as I have painted, it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could have excited such sensation. 
In truth, the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited. For the figure in question had out-Heroded Herod and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There were chords in the hearts of the most reckless which cannot be touched without emotion. Even with the utterly lost to whom life and death are equal jests, there are matters of which no jest can be made. The whole company, indeed, seemed now deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing of the stranger, neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt, and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat. And yet, all this might have been endured, if not approved, by the mad revellers around, but the mummer had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his brow, broad brow, with all the features of his face, was besprinkled with the scarlet horror. When the eyes of Prince Prospero fell on this spectral image, which, with a slow and solemn movement, as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the waltzers, he was seen to be convulsed, in the first moment with a strong shudder, either of terror or distaste, but in the next, his brow reddened with rage. Who dares, he demanded of the courtiers who stood near him, who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him, that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements. It was in the eastern, or blue, chamber in which stood Prince Prospero as he uttered these words. They rang throughout the seven chambers loudly and clearly, for the prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. It was in the blue room where stood the prince with a group of pale courtiers by his side. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of this group in the direction of the intruder who, at the moment, was also near at hand. And now, with deliberate and stately step, made closer approach to the speaker. But from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the mama had inspired the whole party, there were found none who put forth his hand to seize him, so that unimpeded he passed within a yard of the prince's person. And while the vast assembly, as with one impulse, shrank from the centers of the rooms to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly, but with the same solemn and measured step which had dis distinguished him from the first. Through the blue chamber to the purple. Through the purple to the green. Through the green to the orange. Through this again to the white. And even thence to the violet. Ere a decided movement had been made to arrest him. It was then, however, that the Prince Prospero, maddened with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers, while none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all. He bore aloft a drawn dagger and had approached in rapid impetuosity to within three or four feet of the retreating figure, when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry, and the dagger dropped gleaming upon the sable carpet, upon which most instantly afterward fell prostrate in death the Prince Prospero. Then, summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of the revelers at once threw themselves into the black apartment, and seizing the mummer whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped in unutterable horror at finding the grave cerements and corpse-like mask which they handled with so violent a rudeness, untenanted by any tangible form. And now was acknowledged 
the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revellers in the blood bejeweled halls of their revel, and died, each one in the despairing posture of his fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with that of the last of the game, and the flames of the tripods expired, and darkness and decay and the red death held inimitable dominion over all.